Amen. O oh, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today in the Gospel of Mark, as was read, you heard that there were really two, two different parts going on. For those of you who were here were last week, just a quick recap, because it kind of sets the stage for what's going on today. Last week we talked about Jesus being on a mission. And I kind of liken that to a road trip. We're not stopping, we're going, just moving ahead. Well, Jesus was on a mission to go to Jerusalem, to get there and to die for the sins of men. That's what his father had ordained from beforehand. There was a little interruption along the way. Jesus had cast out a demon from a boy who was struggling, the father pleading with him. He took a bit of a time, but his mission wouldn't be deterred. He would keep going ahead. So we come to our section today. They departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he didn't want anyone to know it. You'll see that theme throughout the Gospels that Jesus says, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. And it, it seems almost like a mixed message because usually preachers and pastors and, and fellow Christians will say, tell the world about Jesus. Well, now's a good time to tell the world about Jesus. But in the Gospels, there was a good reason. See, as Jesus had left the region of Caesarea Philippi and was making his way towards Capernaum, there was a struggle. They wanted to make Jesus king. They wanted to elevate Jesus to a political figure, to be, to be the ruler of Israel, but not Israel in God's terms, in Israel in their terms, which was the current nation of Israel where guys like Pontius Pilate and Roman centurions roamed the streets, even the disciples had get, gotten caught up in it a little bit. See, that's kind of the backdrop for as they were walking on the road, the scripture says, Jesus taught his disciples, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand, it says in verse 32, and they were afraid to ask. That's a marked difference from what the disciples normally do, right? Just as you were taught in school, if you don't understand something, what do you do? Well, you put up your hand, you ask questions. Same thing here in the church. If you read something in the Bible, nothing makes pastor happier than to get those Sunday afternoon emails saying, hey, I read something. You said something. Can you explain a little deeper? I want to know more. That's a great thing for a disciple to do. It's a good thing for student in school to do as well. Don't just let it pass you by. It might show up on a test. Fortunately for the Christian, that's not going to be the test. When we get to heaven, there's no little multiple choice. And oh, I'm so sorry, your grade doesn't pass. So we're, we're good on that. And the disciples normally ask Jesus, what do you mean by these parables? But here they hold back. And there's a couple of different commentators out there that kind of mention reasons why. I mean, one of it was, this was someone who could cast out demons. They just couldn't for a moment believe what Jesus was saying. Now, this is not the first time he said it. He said it in Mark 8.31 as well, that Jesus would be, would be tried by the Sanhedrin, that he would die and rise again. See, there's always the hope of the resurrection mixed in with this. But what follows, of course, as they were walking on the road, they had a dispute among themselves about who would be the greatest. And you can kind of understand what they were maybe thinking. Well, if Jesus is king and he's going to be killed, somebody has to take over afterwards. And here comes the very human and the very real struggle that's going to take place. The very real and the very human struggle that takes place is who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to be the leader? Who gets to call the shots? Maybe the disciples struggled with why God would allow such a thing. Jesus said all the time, the Son of Man, the Son of God. He uses them interchangeably. They're Old Testament references, and they point to the fact that he was the Messiah. How could he possibly be killed? And who would take over when he was gone? Now, there's an important thing for the church to address here. And I've shared with you a few times when I'm out evangelizing, witnessing, call it what you will, anytime you share the word of God with someone and what Jesus has done, you're, you're being an evangel. And, that, and that's a good thing. 
When I talk with people, usually one of the first questions that comes up is what we know as the theodicy question. If God is so good, how can he allow evil in the world? And it's certainly a valid question. Now, most, of, most people just kind of stop there and say, well, I don't need to believe about God. But ultimately, we have to wrap our heads around understanding evil in the world. Where did it come from? Why did God allow it? And why doesn't God just put an end to it? And I'll be honest, even as a, a student of the scriptures, I often struggle with that too. I read that God is good, but really atrocious things happen in this world. If God really loved us as his people, if he, if he loved the world like his word says he does, wouldn't he just put an end to war and rapes and child abductions? Wouldn't he put an end to cancer and suffering? It seems to make sense on the surface, doesn't it? So usually when I'm challenged with that, there's, there's a couple of different ways to kind of explain it. The, the one that's in our, our text for today has to deal with God's plan. See, God plans some things to take place. And a lot of times we as human beings don't understand why. I, I can't explain why, why somebody's daughter got abducted and had to suffer the way she did. I, I can't explain why somebody gets shot in gang violence just walking down the street. I don't necessarily have the whole picture. And as much as I would like God to stop all of that, did, did you hear our reading in the book of James today about envyings and jealousy and strife and, and bad things? Well, the question I normally ask is, well, how much evil do you want God to stop? See, it's fine for us to go, well, God should just stop all evil. That would be a good God. Nothing bad should ever happen. Well, the reality is if God stopped all evil all the time, that means he would have to take my life right this very day because I'm not perfect. I hurt my spouse. I hurt my kids. I hurt others around me. I think things, say things, and do things that Christians ought not to do. So if I'm busy doing evil because that is my nature, that's what we confessed at the beginning of, of service, then none of us should live, right? And that's usually when the person I'm talking with goes, no, 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 not that stuff, like the really bad stuff. And I'm like, oh, I see. So it's really bad when you decide it's really bad and it's not quite so bad if you decide it's not quite so bad. Jesus, it's a pleasure to meet you because you've just made yourself to be God. See, we as the pot, we as the, as, as the clay, in our sinful nature, that's where evil comes from. It comes from us. We decide, we choose evil. Our sinful natures lead us to sin and we give in to the temptations that's why it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. James wasn't kidding. But we give in and we give in to the things we know we shouldn't do. And it hurts others around us. And we want to say to God, well, we have a better way than you. Well, in the context of what we have here, I dare say the most evil thing that ever took place was the trial and murder of Jesus Christ. Even the malefactor on the cross was able to say, this man's innocent. Pilate, well, this man has done no wrong. Everybody along the whole way knew that it was out of envy and jealousy that Jesus had been put on the cross. And from the prophet Jeremiah today, like a lamb led to the slaughter, right? Jesus didn't resist. He was handed over into the hands of sinful men. So if Jesus... If Jesus and what happened to him was the most ultimate evil, and I dare say it is, and God was to stop all evil, as a theologian, I now have a, a, a conundrum. Because even though I want God to stop evil, I'm failing to recognize that through the evil of humanity, God brought about the salvation of my sins. He redeemed me by the blood of Christ. Had God stopped Jesus from being murdered on the cross, where then would the sacrifice for my sins be? They couldn't be anywhere. Because each of us gathers every single week thankful that Jesus ascended the cross. 
was delivered into the hands of sinful men that his blood might be shed for the healing of the world. We forget that our God is the one who brings beauty from ashes. We forget that we have the same God who let Joseph be sold into slavery, sit in prison so that he could ascend to be second in command in Egypt and spare his people of a famine because he was a wise leader who brought things into a storehouse. See, we understand evil and suffering in a different way than the world does. The world is screaming, let it stop. The Christian is screaming, Lord, let it be to your glory. See, that's a different in understanding. Now, we don't go looking for suffering. We don't go rushing into it as fools. But we do have a different perspective saying, yes, it's tragedy. Yes, we pray against it. But the Christian can always pray, thy will be done, because we don't see the beginning and the end. If we're lucky, we might get 90 or 100 years. A few people live past that. That's a pretty small view when you have a God who lives in eternity. How can I know what he's doing? How do I know how all of this is going to play out? I'm talking the little things in my life. I know the bigger picture. The bigger picture, as we sang, is we will rise from the graves when Christ returns. We will reign and rule victorious, and all of the things of this earth shall pass away. Those things we know to be true. But I can't tell you what God will make of the ashes and the beauty that he can bring. The scriptures teach us that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, who trust in him, and yeah, the times can be hard, the times can be rough, but Jesus walks in the valley with us. That's kind of the whole point of, of this scripture is that God is never far from us in our struggles, but he's there with us in the midst. As we suffer, he suffers too. God will bring about his plan and his purposes through all of it. But the disciples, of course, were busy arguing, okay, well, if Jesus is gone, who gets to be in charge? And that's where the whole money thing with Peter comes into play. We know that Jesus had Peter, James, and John, right? The inner circle. Anyone here ever been part of an inner circle? All right, I'll put my hand up. Every now and again, I get let in. And then you know what I do to those who are on the outside? <laughs> You're out there, I'm in the inner circle. Ooh. It's our sinful human nature, right? We love to be part of that inner group. And those guys are out there. Peter, James, and John, you can almost hear the argument going on. And man, we know from other scriptures that, you know, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they're like, hey, Lord, can you grant us a favor? He's like, what do you want? Well, I want to sit on your left. I want to sit on your right. <laughs> the seats of power and glory. And we can see how that in the Christian church, as it was mentioned in James and a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned about Jesus. He doesn't show partiality. He doesn't look at the checks you write and go, hmm, well, you get to get away with more than that guy. He doesn't make those kinds of judgments. Everybody matters in God's eyes. He doesn't show that partiality. If you want to be the greatest, Jesus would teach, you have to be the least and the servant of all. And that's really hard to do because if we admit our, our, our human nature for just a moment, don't we love to be served? None of us wants to work all day long, come home, have to do the dishes before we cook the dinner, cook the dinner, and then have kids jump on Fortnite without even saying thank you. Who, who wants that? But can you do that with a servant heart, with, with cheer in your heart, knowing that as you've done for others, you've done unto Christ? As you've served others, you've served your Lord. As I mentioned last week, it's real easy to love God. He's perfect. But loving your neighbor as yourself and doing good to those who aren't always so nice to you elevates and raises that bar. And that's what Jesus is really trying to teach. And that's, and that's why he takes a little kid and puts him in their midst. Now, parents in the days of old, they, of course, loved their children. Abraham loved Ishmael and Isaac. They loved their children. We love our children today, sometimes a little bit too much. But little children have a unique quality about them, don't they? E even the roughest and the gruffest of people, when they see little children just playing, can often find some joy in their heart. 
And then when they misbehave, though they don't like kids quite as much again, but, but for the most part, we love little kids, right? They laugh and they cheer and they giggle and they smile. And I have yet in my many years of ministry to see one of the children kind of kick down the front door and go, I've arrived. <laughs> they don't do that. They're not all pretentious. They're not, they're not worried about being served first when they're at the wedding table. Usually it's because they've grabbed all of the candy from the side dishes anyway. But, you know, children are, are just innocent. And they don't see the color of skin. And it's not until they grow a little older do they get selfish. If you give two cookies to a little kid, what do they do? They turn to their friend and they give them one. It's almost like they have no concept that there's a limited supply of cookies. Did you get that? See, we as human beings, our envying, our striving, and our strife comes from the sin that is within us that wars and forgets that our God is a God who provides. Our God is a God who has a limitless storehouse to give us far more than we could ever ask for. With God, there will never be without. But we get two cookies and we go, oh, if I give one away, I only got one left. We forget that we have a God who can take a couple of fish and some loaves and feed 5,000 with 12 left over. Whoever receives one of these in my name. What Jesus is saying to the disciples is, you're, you're on the road and you can clam up, but I know what you were arguing about. You're on the road arguing about who's going to be the Lord of all. And I think Jesus probably had a little flash in his mind. For in just a few short weeks, he would find himself in an upper room with a towel around his waist, washing dirty, stinky fishermen's feet, saying, if I've done this unto you, go and do likewise to one another. Imagine that the sinless, perfect creator of the universe washing the feet of his creation. Really kind of puts things in perspective when we're like, I want my way. Why won't anyone listen to me? I want to be the greatest and where's my party and how come I didn't get a bonus? Where's my raise and how come they got promoted and I didn't? It really helps put things back in perspective. If you want to be great, Jesus teaches, you've got to be last and the servant of all. He did it himself, and he left us that perfect example. He went to the cross and gave up everything so that we might inherit a kingdom beyond imagination. What a loving and gracious God we serve. You know, to be friends with the world is to be at enmity with God and his enemies. It breaks my heart when I look out at the world and I see that so many don't understand the God that we serve. We serve him because he first served us and we love him because he first loved us. He's given us everything so that we might have when we deserve nothing. Man, that blows my mind and, 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 and just, I'm beyond words. That's the God that we serve. Please go out and share that God with the world who works for hard taskmasters, who, who doesn't understand the joy the joy of being set free in Christ, loved just because we're his, not for the things that we do. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.